off and he was wakened by the sound of, is there a doctor on board? Now, the thing is, he says as a medical doctor, he actually likes that. He says, because almost always it's, it's, it's nothing. It's not even much of emergency, but you know, they go there and the staff, you know, they help stand by a patient at some point and, and, uh, and the staff thanks them profusely and then you and so often will give a gift. And, and so he likes that. But, uh, this time as he goes back, uh, uh it was an actual emergency and he was thankful because there was actually another doctor there already. And the person uh, was ha having a heart attack, some kind of cardiac arrest. And, and as they were waiting for emergency crews to get there, the doctor who was there, he says, and from his perspective, he's like, there's really nothing to do. I mean, generally speaking, you, uh, there's not a lot you can do with someone until you wait for the emergency teams to show up. You just kind of stand by the bedside. And for him, you know, to be at the foot of this person, he had even less. But the, the other doctor that was there seemed to know what he was doing. I mean, he asked for a stethoscope and began to monitor the patient's heart. He uh, asked for a blood pressure cuff and, and uh, was taking the blood pressure, also one of the little oxygen monitors, and was checking that, asked about his medication, and there were some heart pills, and he ha had him take those. And, and as he went in, just kept repeating it over the time and, and uh, until the emergency crew showed up, because remember, they hadn't taken off yet, and so they uh, end up leaving. And... And he's, he says to the doctor, he's like, hey, you know, good job. He says, what, what's your specialty? He says, oh, I'm an allergist. And he goes, okay, as a medical doctor, like, there wasn't a lot I could do. He was even less prepared. Like, that's not, that isn't in his wheelhouse. He says, but what he did is he just, you know, remained calm, pretended like he knew what he was doing, and just uh, got, got through the moment. And uh, he's like, you know, good job. The reason I share this is because I wonder how much uh, that kind of awkward, just kind of pretending what you, you know what you're doing, is what we as followers of Jesus face when, when we are told that we need to share the gospel with other people. That we don't, uh, we, we, we hope there's not a real case we have to sometimes, but if we end up having to and we're in this place and we just hopefully we can pretend we know what we're doing and, 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 and just make it pass and look calm. But the truth is, is that I, I think we are woefully unprepared. Um, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, um, in many ways I think this sermon can be really helpful for you. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think you'll get a chance to hear the heart of God. But also, I, I wonder what the world generally thinks of the idea of Christians sharing their faith. As if it is some like, I don't know, we're going to propagate the organization and we're, you know, there's this uh, Ponzi scheme type of you got to keep getting new people in. And that's not at all what's going on. We've been doing this series uh, called Discipleship, our biblical to-do list. Because there are things in Scripture that God asks us to do, and in part we do it because we love God, and we just do things as a result of that relationship with Him, and other times we do it because we want to feed into that relationship, just like we might with any other kind of relationship. There are things we do to help the relationship and things we do as a result of the relationship. Well, and the thing is, is I think generally... Generally speaking, most followers of Jesus, most of us understand it is our responsibility to share the gospel with other people. Like, I think we understand that. Uh, I actually saw some statistics. They're a little older, and it's hard for me to know, but they say that generally uh, people in Bible-believing churches, that they, they do it. They get it. And they say, yeah, it is our responsibility. But then when asked if you have shared your faith with someone uh, who doesn't share your beliefs, who has a different set of beliefs, and you've shared the gospel with them, the number of people that have done that in the past year drops precipitously. It just, we don't often do it. But just in case you aren't convinced you should, let me see if I can build the case a little bit. The idea that we should be doing it. And I'm going to go right here to 2 Corinthians. That says, and this is the first blank in your outline, that we are ambassadors. I love this imagery. Check it out. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. So talking about the fact that if we are in Christ, everything's different. 
everything's new. We, what, what was old is to be gone. What is new is now here. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. This comes from God the Father who reconciled, who, who brought us back into relationship, who brought us into relationship with himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You see what's going on? Jesus has reconciled us to himself and has then asked us to be involved in that work of reconciling others. That God himself was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So, interestingly enough, even though we have the ministry of reconciliation, it's not our job to reconcile people to God, but that God is continuing to reconcile. He's given us the message of reconciliation, that it is our job to let people know about this reality. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God ambassadors. I love that imagery. Now, I have to tell you, I don't know really know a lot about ambassadors. My understanding is, you know, some, uh, a new administration comes in and the people they really like get to go be ambassadors. And, and if they really, really like you, you get to go to a cool place. And if they don't like you so much, you go to a really tough place or something. I'm not entirely sure how it works. I've seen a number of movies uh, with ambassadors and that kind of thing. But how it actually works in practice. So I, I, find, I find the dictionary definition very helpful. I I always get a little frustrated when people do that in a speech. Go, and the dictionary says, because, well, I'm, I'm going to totally go on a tangent here. Uh, I have a very different idea of dictionaries than it seems a lot of people. A lot of people think dictionaries prescribe what words are supposed to be. And I don't think that's the case at all. A good dictionary is simply describing how we already use words. And that's why it should change from time to time, because we, how we use words changes. However, I thought this definition, the American Heritage, 5th edition, was really kind of helpful for us this morning. It says that an ambassador is a diplomatic official of the highest rank, appointed and accredited as a representative in residence by one government or sovereign to another, usually for a specific length of time. Why is that helpful? Because if you think about us being ambassadors, ambassadors of Christ, that means at least a, th a few things. The first thing that it means is that this is not our country. This world is not our world. We are in this foreign residence. We are somewhere else as, as Christ's representative here in this world. Well, why is that important? One, I think what it means that an ambassador, what an ambassador should, is not worried about getting comfortable. Not worried about getting comfortable in this world. Not worried about getting comfortable in this other country. Because that isn't really your home. Your home is somewhere else. And if we, if you and I work on trying to build a life that, you know, the good life that's comfortable here, we're missing what our job is as ambassadors. An ambassador shows up, lives in a home that's not really his, in a country that's not his, and is doing the stuff that he's supposed to be doing. But for him to just go, you know, my whole job here while I'm here for this four years or eight years or however, the term that I'm an ambassador, I'm just going to make sure I'm comfortable and it's fun for me to be here is missing the point. Furthermore, as ambassadors, that we don't settle in. Our job isn't to adopt the culture of where we're going. You know, there's so much in our world that is just normal. I was looking on social media yesterday, and, and I, don't, I don't entirely remember what the question was. Something about values you might find in a mate, and says, is this important? And I saw one of the comments, it just stood out to me, goes, well, of course not. It's 2024. Meaning, you know, things have changed, and, and what's normal, it's 2024, things are different now. Things, and, and, and there's a new normal that we create in this new world about what we value and what we look for in one another. And I sit there and I think, you know, we could, and we probably are tempted, to start adopting the values of the people around us, what everybody else considers normal. But it's not the ambassador's job to adopt the culture around him, as much as it is to live properly within that culture. 
Another thing about an ambassador is what they are there to do is serve the interests of their sovereign. They aren't there to serve their own interests. It's not like they go into that country and say, you know, I know the way this country really needs to operate. So I'm going to get a bunch of people. I'm going to get some others. We're going to convince them to change and have a different country and be different and do all those things and, and, and have this agenda that, we, that might be something else. And I wonder if Christians, if we, we often do that, we think our job in this world, in this city, in this neighborhood, is we need to somehow, you know, pull the levers of power and get the world to change so that they agree with us. That we need to go out and, and maybe, you know, share the gospel with people so that they become Christians as we would define Christians, and then we have an agenda, and then life will finally be good in the city. And, and frankly, that may be our job, but it's one step removed. Our job is not to figure out how things should operate and get the world to do that, but to serve the interests of our king with our king figuring out the way things need to operate. You know, contrast these two ideas. I knew of a lady, I, I, I didn't know her personally, but other people, they were talking about growing up in, in a Christian household and how much they hated it. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, my, my mom, or maybe it was a grandma or something, I don't remember who exactly, that, but we go to her house and she had very strict rules about things you can say, things you can't say, things you can do, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and it's like, okay, I get that. I get that you have boundaries and things how you want to operate in your home. But what she would do is if somebody crossed those lines, she would be mean. How dare you? This is a Christian household. And you're going to operate this way and it's going to be this way or you can go out the door. So she was setting up her kingdom. She was setting up her agenda of the way things she thought it would be and using whatever force she could muster to make that happen. Contrast that to Luke 15. This is Jesus talking. He's talk this is in the same passage with the parable of the, you know, the prodigal son and the shepherd and the sheep. This is uh, the one of the lost coin. So he says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The heart of God is that you and I and other people that, that were seen as, as lost. Did you catch that in the ambassadors where it says reconciliation? Like we're reconciled, like it's happening again? There is this image that you and I were built and belong to God and that we have left, that we, have, that we are a lost coin that God wants to bring back in. It's very different than pulling the levers of power and using our force to demand people behave the way we think they should behave. It's more of a sense of a God who desperately longs to be with each and every one of us. That we are a coin worth finding that there's literally a celebration in heaven when people decide that they want to be back with God. There was a party with your name on it when the miracle of you returning to God happened. And there's a party waiting every other person who also wants to join and be part of God. The third thing an ambassador does. Well, before I go on to the third thing, I, let me, this is the heart of God. I don't know how much of sharing the gospel with other people, telling the story, is the fact that we don't really care about them. We really just don't care about their soul. We don't care about their relationship with God. We don't care how they spend their life and their eternity. Maybe we just don't care. Maybe it's all we care about is making sure, you know, they like us and that we don't bother them and, and that we all get along. Maybe, maybe that's all we care about. But can we at least care that God cares that God wants to find that lost coin he wants to be with this person that that the person we say we worship and care about cares deeply about people and can if we can't care directly can we at least care what our God cares about 
maybe it matters. I had a friend, Chad, when I was in high school, and, and he wasn't a believer by any means. And I remember when I got the courage, and I just said, hey, let's, I just, we just need to talk about this, and we need to talk about uh, faith, and, and I think it's really important. And he said to me after I shared with him, he didn't, I, I didn't get any sense that he was willing to accept it, any of that, but he did say to me something that I've remembered ever since. He goes, you know, it's the, fact, the mere fact that you're willing to share this that suggest that makes me think that this might be true. You see, because if everybody else who says that this is the mo most important thing that matters for all eternity, and they don't bother saying anything, they either don't really believe it or they don't really care about me. But the third thing is that an ambassador is there for only a small amount of time. Folks, we are in this world only for a small amount of time. That should give us one sense of urgency to make sure we're doing the things that need to be done. That, that we're praying the prayers that need to be prayed, that we're reading the books that need to be read, that we're um, talking to the people that need to be talked to, but that realize that there are those in our lives that we know that have a chance to be cared for and loved and shown a, a God who loves and cares for them. It also means that whatever difficulties arise from living that kind of lifestyle are also pretty temporary. This isn't our home. <laughs> There's an old story. I didn't mean to, to talk about this, but the, I love this about some missionaries. I've shared this before, right? Coming home on a plane after serving in a mission field for a really long time, they come home. And interestingly enough, there was another plane that was landing, and there were some dignitaries or pop stars or something, I don't know, coming off that plane. And, and as soon as they came back, like the crowd is around there celebrating. There's a band, everybody playing, and, and uh, missionaries you know, one of the spouses says to another, says, you know, we spent our entire life uh, serving over there. There's no band for us. There's no celebration of our return. And the, the other spouse says, yeah, that's because we're not home yet. We're not home yet. So with that said, to realize that we've got this limited amount of time, I hope you can believe that God cares and this is something we would actually do. The bigger question that comes is how do we possibly do that? That this world is really, really difficult, especially here in the West. That pe it's, not, it's not even that people um, are somehow offended. I mean, maybe they're offended, the, hearing uh, the idea about Jesus and hearing Christian, but they're just generally not interested. They just don't, there's, there's nothing in their worldview that kind of makes sense with this connection. And so you sharing Jesus with them is almost the equivalent of them trying to share the UFOs landed in their yard. You'd be like, yeah, I don't really find that believable or plausible. And if you want to say, hey, come over to my house, I want to show you UFOs in my backyard. Unless it was close and convenient, chances are you wouldn't go. It doesn't, doesn't interest you. You don't buy it. And we live in a world that's like that. There's no social benefit. It used to be in the United States that there might have been a social benefit to belonging to a church, to being connected, that kind of stuff. So even if you weren't a Christian, maybe just kind of going along or pretending like you were and joining the culture, that's not true anymore. It's not true anymore. So we have a world that just doesn't even know. And it feels like a most unique time in history that they have no context whatsoever. But it's not unique. I read this amazing book by a guy, I, I'm getting his name wrong, Hurtado. Uh, he wrote, uh, it was an academic paper, and he was talking, and he turned it into a book, so basically a PhD thesis into a book, and, say, and the title of the book is, Why Did Anybody Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? Or why on earth would anyone become a Christian in the first three centuries? And he starts talking about the experience of what it was like and what that world was like. You know, because we often have a lot of reasons. Why did the early church, why did they seem to explode? Why did they seem to be able to reach people? Why did people become Christian? And there are lots of really interesting answers. Well, you know, they had a lot of concern for the poor, and they gave them, well, okay, that might make sense for the poor, but it wasn't just the poor who accepted Christ. That there were people of middle income and, and some rich that, that joined as well. How do you explain that? It wasn't necessarily, or, or, you know, they would have the social benefit, they would have these connections. None, none of that. Matter of fact, let me quote from the book specifically. It's clear that becoming a Christian adherent in the first three centuries typically involves some significant costs 
Catch this. Because I would argue that this is the same as today. Would typically involve some significant costs in terms of social and even political slash judicial consequences. Among relatives and acquaintances, neighbors and associates, responses could vary from puzzlement through hurt and anger to hostility, ostracism, violence, and even denunciation to judicial authorities. Well, I don't think we're there in America or to the point that you're going to be in trouble politically. Well, maybe politically, but not judicially because of the fact that you're a Christian. The, the first three centuries of the world, when, when people started sharing the gospel for the first time ever, were not too unlike what it is living here in Portland area. So how can we do this? Well, I have to tell you, I, I, I had a chance to read another book that I'm, I'm really going to recommend. I read it this week in anticipation of this, and I think it's great, so I'm just going to recommend it, and I love the title. How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. It was a great book, and it has a lot of really uh, specific ideas and things that we can do. And, and, you know, notice that the subtitle is Personal Evangelism in a Skeptical World. Because we do live in a skeptical world, and a lot of the ideas and things that I shared, whether it was a story about the doctor on a plane or, you know, those kind of things, all come from this book. And I think it's certainly worth looking at. But, but I want to share a couple of these ideas on how you can go about doing it. If you believe that God cares about people, you also, if you don't care about people, maybe you do, Maybe you do care about people, but you at least care about that God cares. Here's some steps you can take. And I'm just going to give you ones that, so you and I can start today. If you haven't been doing any kind of sense of sharing the gospel with people, or you would be one of those people who says, yeah, I haven't really done that in the past year, this is a way you and I can start right here, right now. The first is, and the next blank in your outline, merge the universes. Here in the West, U.S., U.K., uh, Australia, Canada, those kind of things that, that uh, it can really look like the influence of Christians is falling. And it is true. That is happening. It's not happening worldwide. Matter of fact, we are seeing a resurgence and a surge in, in places in South America and Africa, parts of Asia that are the, starting to explode. And Christianity is still growing like crazy. And so the center of Christianity is moving from the West, if it ever was, into these other areas. So worldwide, we're not, it's not. But right here, it certainly can feel that way. And you've got a world here that people completely don't even know. They think they know what Christians believe, but they don't really know. They, there are caricatures, there are, are things, and they just assume. They live in these little bubbles, and they don't know even other Christians. Or they may know them, and they not know they know them. Lisa was telling me about a time, you know, she's a nurse, and she was there, and a doctor was coming, and, and he was talking, and, and he's in this group of nurses, and he just mentions how, yeah, he would never work at this one hospital. I don't remember if it was Providence or Seventh-day Adventist or whatever, the Adventist hospital. I don't remember which one he said he'd never work in. He goes, I'd never work there because, you know, all those religious folks that do things this way. What? And I don't even remember exactly what his issue was and how he stated it. But what I find really fascinating, here is this doctor in a group, in a hospital with a group of nurses around, and he either assumes everybody deeply cares about his opinion, or more likely, he just assumed everybody agreed with him. He didn't expect for a second that he was there among those who called themselves Christian. And the truth is, I think, that, I, I think that's really what happens because people live in their own little bubbles. They, they, they read articles and, and follow people on social media, and everybody seems to agree with them, and they don't understand how those idiots could disagree with them. And they just don't get it, and they live in this little bubble. And the truth is... Christians can do the same thing. We can start making sure, well, I, you know, I, I'm only listening to people who agree with me and moving those toxic people out of my life and, and I only have these, you know, when we, we put this little bubble where the only influence we ever get is everybody who agrees with us. I've mentioned social media a couple times. I'm not talking about social media. I have never once in my life heard the story where somebody goes, you know, I wasn't a Christian, I was very anti-Christian, and I remember this one day, though, when some Christian posted some biting comment on social media that changed my mind. 
Like, no. A, a Christian shared a meme and it changed everything. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. There's something very radical that I'm suggesting in merging the universes. Note this in Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That you and I are to have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. And what is that? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This is called the incarnation, that God literally came down to where we were, into our place to merge the universe, the universe that, that of God and the spiritual, and yet he came to where we were in the flesh. That our job is to be the one who helps merge the universes, to go be in places where they are, that you and I bridge the gap. Now, there may be non-Christians who are working to try to bridge the gap with other Christians. That may happen. But generally speaking, our culture is so divided, so that in all these culture wars and all the things going on, we see each other as the enemy. There is nothing in their worldview that suggests that they need to work to bridge the gap to come over to our side. Instead, we must bridge the gap. Because our worldview, our God, tells us it's our job to be like Christ Jesus, who though in heaven, equal to God, decided to come and be with us, to reach out to us. We need to think about every single person we met, meet as having an eternal destiny. It matters how we treat the person at the drive through It matters how we treat our family. It matters how we treat our neighbors. As a matter of fact, that's where I really want to stress. I really want us to think in terms of reaching our neighbors, the people physically located around us. The reason is, is because the average person stays in their home about 13.2 years, which is about four times as long as people might stay at a job. You've got a real chance to be connected to your neighbors in ways that you won't have a chance with hardly anyone else. So I want you to think about that. Matter of fact, maybe God's putting somebody on your mind right now. We'll get to that in a second. But the next thing, the next step is go, do, go to their things. Go to their things. I find this really interesting. Here in Luke, we get this passage. It goes on to go elsewhere. But I, I love how it starts when Jesus is saying, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. He went. I think one of the best things you and I can do if we have friends that aren't Christian or people that we just learning how to be friends with, go to their stuff. They say, hey, my kid's having a play. Do you want to go? Yes, I'll go. They invite you to over for dinner. I have a neighbor who did. He had his, his wife had a big birthday celebration, but it was during COVID. And so they just invited people over and just people in the neighbor because that's all they could do. And they invited. And you bet. It's like, absolutely, we're going to go. We're going to go and hang out with you guys, and we're going to eat, and we're just going to spend time. We're going to go to your things. And it may take sacrifice, you know, because the truth is we all just, you know, we get home from a busy day. We just want to go home, and we want to watch whatever's on there and, and have a quiet night, evening at home. And it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us something to show up and go to their stuff. I mean, if nothing else... I mean, when you invite them to your stuff, how do they even know that you've curated all, that you even care about all of them and you think it's relevant to them and you're not just trying to get numbers up on something? Well, one of the ways they know you care is because you've been involved in their stuff. Now, with that said, I want to be careful about, man, how am I doing on time? I've only got a couple minutes. I am not for a second suggesting you treat your neighbors as some agenda to make sure that you convert them to Christ. I am not suggesting that. Because remember, our goal isn't to have our own agenda. I need to make sure they become Christian. That's, that's not your job. That's God's job. Your job is to love and care for them and share the gospel. And, and there is some place where you're going to have to share it and it's going to be tough. Um, you know, we, we navigate this all the time. You know, in dreaded uh, romantic, potentially romantic relationships, we talk about the friend zone. 
right? You're, you're really interested in someone. I've never had this happen to me, but... You know, there's a girl I like, and I really like her, and she's like, oh, Bill, you're, you're just a great friend. And, and, and immediately, as soon as that happens, like, I'm in this really awkward situation of, like, I've got to figure out, again, hypothetically, this never has ever happened. No, but that I've got to figure out, so I, you know, if, if, if I push too hard, I could end up scaring her away. But on the other hand, if I just resign to, okay, I'll just be a good friend, then I'll, I'll, I've never taken my shot that I'll never see if anything more can happen. So navigating that's tough. And, and so there is that issue with us and talking about people. Like, we want to be friends with them. We want to take a shot at being able to share the gospel with them. How do we do it? We don't want to be pushy, but we don't want to wimp out altogether. I don't know. I, that, that's a tough one. Again, there are some ideas on ways you can do that. I think in that book, there's some really good conversation pieces. But how about this? How about you just come to know your neighbors? If you don't know your neighbors, make some cookies and go over. Of course, nobody knows their neighbors. We don't really, I mean, we've said hi, but why is it if you are a half a cup of sugar short, your instinct is, I need to go to the store to get more sugar. It's never to go to your neighbors and ask if they have a half a cup of sugar. That almost never happens. Why? Because we are isolated. In it. So go, just, just introduce yourself. Bring some cookies over and say, hey, I'm embarrassed by the fact that I've lived here 13.2 years, and I don't know you very well. So I just want to bring some cookies. I want to see how you're doing. That's it. With that in mind, the third thing we need to do, and where I'm going to wrap this up, is we need to pray. Remember, the goal is not to convert them. The goal is to respond to what God is doing. And if we're going to respond to what God's doing, then we need to be aware of what he's doing. And prayer is the entrance into that that we serve, that we care, that we share. The number one skill is to pray. We pray for them. We pray for each other. Matter of fact, I love the way Paul has this in Ephesians. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. What's he asking? He's asking the rest of the people in his church, the rest of the people in the church in Ephesus specifically, to pray for him, to pray for him as he shares that he would do so fearlessly, that he would make it known, that he understands. I'm an ambassador. He's literally in chains while this is going on. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. How about that as a prayer request? Maybe we could put as a prayer request, pray for me that I may be fearless in sharing the gospel. Pray that. But I've got another suggestion for us this morning. What I want you to do is I want you to think of a neighbor. Remember, I've said neighbor. I'm pushing the idea of neighbor if God has put something else on your heart, you like know somebody in your family, you know somebody at work, that's fine. There's already a name, but if you don't have a name, what I want you to do is I want you to think of a name this morning, right now, of somebody that you, uh, of a neighbor, if not anybody else, that you care about and you would love to see God work in their lives. And I want you to think of that name, and then the idea would be that you would pray for that person. And you begin to pray daily perhaps, pray that they may see Jesus. Now here's what's going to happen. First, God may, may do something in their life or not. I don't know. But it gives you a chance to, one, say first, God, I know you're at work. I know you're working. And to be cognizant of that because you've been praying. All of a sudden you're in this place where you're recognizing God is at work. Second, because you're praying, you'll begin to watch for what God might do. Who knows? Maybe all of a sudden this neighbor or somebody else begins to ask you questions about something that, that matters. Something deeper than, hey, how's the weather? Nice blue sky or, oh, great, it's rain again. But maybe they go into things that they're struggling with, things they need help with, things that are maybe even something spiritual. And you begin to be aware of that and you will be much more cognizant, much more likely to take advantage because you have been in prayer. And then third, it allows you to join him as an ambassador that, that you say, this is something I've been praying for. So here's what we have for you. Out there on the table, some of you saw this when you were coming in, we have a place for you to write a name on a piece of paper. To just, in your own handwriting, to write a name on a piece of paper. And what we will do, actually we, Carrie Ann will do, They'll take it. So I, I, have, I have this neighbor, Zarette. So Zarette, if you're watching this, I'm praying for you. Am I praying that you would receive Jesus? I actually am. But I just want to be a better friend. I want to be a better neighbor. 
I am looking out for you as best as I know how. Because God is looking out for you. So I have put Zerat, and, and it's, uh, to, to make it, and they, she will take whatever you write and put it on a little bookmark, a little wooden bookmark. That, that's a little more permanent. So you can just keep it. And you can put it in a book. If you're a reader, you can hang it up, you know, put it on the dash of your car so you can see it, put it on the counter in your bathroom so when you go to brush your teeth and begin to pray. And just do that. Commit for the rest of the year to just pray and see what might happen. Do you realize somebody did that for you? I don't know if they were praying every day. I got a sneaking suspicion somebody did, and somebody was willing to share the truth of who God was with you. If you care about God at all, it's because somebody else cared about you enough to let you know that God cared about you. And you're just living that legacy. Let's pray. Lord, I know lots of people who said they'd been praying for me over the years, some, frankly, that prayed in disbelief. I remember Brocky telling me, it's like, wow, God could even reach Bill. So I thank you for the people in my life who prayed, who cared, who were willing to share what they knew of you because they cared about me. Because this relationship with you is worth everything. And so I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry that, that I haven't been better at really caring for my neighbors. I have my own agenda. You know, I have an agenda. I'd like a real comfortable life. I'd, I'd like things to go smoothly. I'd like to relax. I'd like to set up shop and just get absorbed into the culture. But you've called me to be an ambassador. This is not my home. And though they don't know it, for the, the, my neighbors and my family, it's not, it's not their home either. Help me to, however you want to use me, to serve and love and care for them. If all I ever do is help my neighbor move stuff into his garage, okay. But meanwhile, I'm going to pray, I'm going to look for you, and I want to join you in whatever your agenda is in the lives of the people around me. In Jesus' name, amen? Well, if you have...